Uh, welcome to another episode of the Gap Down Backer Podcast. Uh, today we have a fantastic guest with us. Um, Coach is the special teams coordinator at uh, the legendary Ben Davis High School um, in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, Coach Alex Kirby. Coach, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. No problem, Coach. Uh, Coach is con- going to kind of talk opponent analysis and breakdown. Um, but before we get to that, Coach, uh, for people who don't know you or somehow have lived under a rock and not on Twitter, uh, um, uh, do you want to kind of give a quick background about yourself? I know you got a slide for that. Um, uh, sure. Kind of break that down a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so the biggest thing I always like to get out there uh, right off the bat is is I'm in an unusual position, right? Because I never actually played the game at an organized level. Um, main reason was because, you know, my, my parents honestly thought it was a waste of time growing up, getting into sports. Nobody in my family is really into sports. Uh, I got into it, honestly, because of the Madden video game. Like, I didn't know anything about football, but I started picking up the, the Madden football game, and I started playing. I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. Um, and that was in middle school. And so it just kind of grew from there. Um, but I, uh, I went to Ben Davis High School, as you can see on the slide there. Uh, that was uh, that was the time that Tom Allen was the head coach at Ben Davis, who's now okay. the head coach at IU. Uh, and uh, just as an aside, he is exactly who he appears to be on television. He is 100% the real deal, uh, and that's why you see so many high school coaches uh, pulling for him because he he is he is a great great human being. So everybody who's ever been around him is, is definitely rooting for him and, and IU. Um, but basically what, what happened with me was I, I got on with the, uh, the student radio station there calling the football games and got on as, a, as an analyst, uh, quote unquote, and kind of got closer to the football program that way. And so by my senior year, I was uh, videotaping practices. And then on Friday nights, I would get on the radio and call the games. Uh, stuck around for a few more years after that, continued to volunteer, continued to take on more responsibility. Uh, went to Indiana State, was a student assistant there, uh, became the video coordinator. Uh, that's one of those scenarios where, you know, it's, it was a really small staff, so I got lots of stuff to do. Like I was, I was a student assistant, but for all intents and purposes, I was a quality control grad assistant type of guy because I was breaking down film, putting together scout cards. You know, in a lot of situations, I was running scout def- defense or scout offense, something like that. Uh, I would be in, I was in the box with a headset on during, on game day, talking to guys. So it was a really cool experience for me uh, being a part of college ball. And, and, and now I'm back uh, at Ben Davis where, where, uh, where I graduated from and, and lots of good people here that I've spent a lot of time with uh, and, and talked a lot of football with, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really lucky. It's a, it's a great place to be. The, the kids are awesome. The, the coaches and the administration are awesome. So uh, not a lot of complaints right now, <laughs> honestly. Uh, and then, you know, I'm, I've I've written several books. Uh, the one I did put there, Breaking into Coaching with No Experience, just because uh, I've written a lot of X's and O's stuff, but that's probably, you know, the my most favorite book that I've written because yeah. it is uh, probably the most actionable book that, I, that I've written. I, I've had several people since I put it out write to me that, you know, that's exactly the kind of book that they were looking for. You know, they're in high school or college and they wanted to get into coaching, but they didn't know where to start. And basically, I just tried to give as much firsthand information as I could uh, about how I got into it because I didn't play. I uh, didn't definitely didn't have a dad who was a coach or anybody, you know, a lot of connections getting into this thing. Um, but I really wanted to be around the game and I figured that out pretty early. So I just found a way to get it done. And so hopefully, you know, that that saves people a little bit of time. And, and that is I did want to put that in there. That is available on Amazon and, yeah. and on the website as well. Now, are, are most of your – obviously, you have your own website too, and you talk there. Are most of your books also available on Amazon, or is it just that one? Uh, most of them are, yeah. Okay. Um, so the one that we'll talk about later on uh, is not yet, and, we'll, and I'll explain why. But yeah. I would say 95% of the stuff is is available on Amazon uh, or you can go to throwdeeppublishing.com as well. You can get it wherever you yeah. want. And so I think uh, what we'll do is we'll just get right into it. So first of all, overall philosophy, I think you have to have a philosophy of what you want to do, even when uh, you're talking about something as, as se- seemingly straightforward as breaking down an opponent. Now, uh, I am the special teams coordinator. I just uh, got that role uh, <laughs> about a month ago, actually. 
Um, so this is not necessarily going to be a special teams oriented presentation. Uh, you can take a lot of this stuff and apply it. I feel like to all phases of the game. Uh, but the, the past few years, I was really more of an off the field guy, uh, really trying to keep us a week ahead of, uh, whoever we're going to play. So for example, week one, we're, we're, everybody's getting ready for their week one opponent. I'm breaking down the week two opponents so that by the time the weekend Sunday morning meeting comes around, I've got everything ready to go and we can yeah. just keep on rolling. Um, you know, I'm not a teacher. I work a regular day job. So, you know, at the time I really just didn't have the time to be at practice every day. Things have changed for me, so I've got more time. So that's that's why uh, I've transitioned to a more on the field role. But that's just to give people some background. You know, there's probably a lot of people watching this saying, you know, I don't have a guy. You know, I, I don't have the time to do all that stuff. Maybe not, but I'm explaining to you why I'm doing. I did these things because I did have the time. Because I, you know, most of the time I was not at practice. I was simply breaking down film in the evenings and on weekends. Um, so let's get to it. I mean, when in doubt, watch more film, right? Like that, that it yeah. all comes back to that. I, I don't like to overcomplicate things. Um, I feel like there, there's two groups of coaches, right? There's groups of coaches that just love to dive in and, and watch as, as much film as possible. But I feel like there's a bigger group that feels like it's a necessary evil. Like they'll watch one or two games and, yeah. You know, they might take something from those one or two games out of context, and it really, you know, informs their opinion of the opponent when, you know, when you get late into the season and, and you've got 10 games to watch, you know, it's it's got to be done, whether you like it or not, because uh, you, you can pick up a lot of valuable information. Uh, the next thing, do as much by hand as possible. Now, I'm not saying you should write down, you know, try to do your down and distance reports and all that stuff. By, that's not what I'm saying. What I mean is... Draw, draw as much stuff up as possible, especially if you're facing some kind of scheme that you're unfamiliar with. You know, in, in our conference, we see a good mix of stuff. It's, you know, I would say like most high school coaches, we see a lot of spread stuff, but we also uh, face a very good wing T team every year. They actually won the state championship this year. We, we, uh, we lost to them in the final four uh, th this past season. So, and, and they do a lot of different things and, you know, you're not going to see that most of the time on Saturdays and Sundays on TV. So you're not as familiar with it internally as you would maybe a lot of the spread stuff. So that's, that's a time, especially where, uh, you know, I like to take time and just draw up all 22 guys on the field for some of their, especially for some of their more interesting schemes and just try to get a feel for what they're doing. Uh, and that's just one example. You're just going to retain more if you do stuff by hand. I, I firmly believe that. I know there's a lot of studies out there that, that back me up on that. But if you do stuff by hand, you're, there's just something in your brain that, that causes you to retain uh, more information. And it just forces you to watch things more closely if you're trying to draw up everybody on the field. Have a process, but be flexible. So the, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about tonight, we do not do all of this stuff each week. There's, there's just no way. Like I, I, I do not have the time. We, we have a big <laughs> staff, but we don't have that big of a staff. Um, so, you know, you're going to have, it's, it's just like anything else, right? You're going to have your base stuff that you're going to try to do every week. And then depending on which opponent you're looking at and what you need, you're going to have other tools in the toolbox. Um, and, and that kind of goes into the next thing here, understand what you're going to have to prepare for each year. You know, we don't have a naming system for everything. I don't have a perfectly thought out, you know, plan for every single possible formation and motion and shift because we don't see all that stuff yeah we, we just don't i mean we're, we're gonna see uh some basic spread we we play a couple of h-back teams like i said we play a wing t team so we have a good understanding of how to you know diagnose that stuff label that stuff um but you know hey every once in a while something comes up and you got to figure out okay what do you guys want to call this uh and you just kind of go from there make sure it doesn't conflict with anything i I'm, I'm very much of the, you know, ready, fire, aim, uh, you know, yeah. persuasion, basically, like, just just start doing it. And then you can go back and clean up your data later, like if, if, if something conflicts. Um, also, speaking of that, break up the data into as many individual pieces as possible. And as you're going to see, I'm going to go into depth uh, on some of the custom columns that we use. But, you know, we, you want to... You want to make it as easy as possible to isolate every single variable that you're putting into huddle or whatever system that you're using. So, for example, with our formation column, we don't 
I don't put ace right. Like, you know, for example, I would not put ace right, ace left. I'm going to put ace, right? Uh, because I want to know all those formations. I'm not putting the directional call in the same column because now you've yeah. got an extra layer of things you've got to kind of decipher with your reports. That's just one example, but I, I think everybody kind of gets the point of what I'm well, saying. You, you're, that, you're like the second guy I've heard say that this offseason where they, they they try to break it up as much as possible. And then I also want to go real quick about your drawing up by hands um, point. When I had Don Brown on a couple weeks ago, he talked about that. And you can kind of hear it in some of our gargled interview because of some Zoom issues. Um, but he he talks about how he draws like 150 to 175 by hand of like the run game and run fit stuff still to this day, a week. Which is, I mean, for somebody who's got probably like four GAs and five quality control coaches is pretty impressive. But, but, I mean, it, it really is the best way to yeah. dig in the details and make sure that you're not missing stuff. And you know, I again, I understand that a lot of people watching this, you might not have the, the the resources and the number of assistants that we have. So you might have to, uh, what's the name of it? You might have to use Huddle Assist sometimes to get all that stuff done. And I'm not knocking that. I'm not saying that's necessarily a negative thing, but I do think that you lose out on a little bit of stuff when, when you outsource some of that stuff. It, it takes you away a little bit. I understand sometimes... You have to do it, but if, if there's any way possible that you can spend the time to do that, I, I definitely think it's worth it, especially, you know, I mean, we play in a pretty competitive conference. I mean, I, I yes, think do. The, the, the last state champion that came in our class outside of our conference, I think, was 10 years ago, and before that, it was, I can't, I don't even know how long ago it was before that, so we got to win our conference and there's a lot of good coaches in our conference that we face off against. And here's the other thing. A lot of the guys that are, that are coaching uh, on the, on those other sidelines are the same guys that were there when I was in high school. Uh, maybe not as head coaches, but they were around, they were there. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you have a similar thing in your area where it's, it's the same group of guys in, in different schools. You kind of get familiar with the different coaches in your area and what they like to do. Yeah, you do. And to your point, like with your how your conference is, that's kind of how the MAC is in Ohio. Well, they'll have they'll have two or three state champions out of that out of that conference every year. I mean, you can go four and six if, and and make the playoffs and then make a run in the playoffs because your conference is just so brutal. They had what was it three state champions this year out of that conference because there's like there's like three or four divisions just in that conference and it is wow. like that that is that is the Annas and the New Bremens and the um, oh, I'm just drawing a blank on it. Minster. Like it is, it is an abusive conference, but it is to your point, kind of like yours, where if you won that conference, there's a good chance, unless you see one of those teams in your conference again in the playoffs, you're you're probably about a seventy to eighty percent favorite to win every year. Well, and that's and that's the thing because we are in six A. There's only thirty two teams in our classification, and for people who don't know, in Indiana, everybody makes the playoffs. So, uh, you know, we're going to see those teams again. We had to, we had to play, uh, you know, I, 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 you go back to some of the state championships we've won. We've ended up seeing two or three of those conference opponents either on our way to the state championship game or in the state championship game, depending on how the bracket fell. So a lot of times you got to beat those teams twice, uh, you know, to, to get anywhere. Do you think that's more helpful or more hurtful to have to see them again? Cause I, I can't go back and forth on that personally. Like, Oh yeah, I've seen them again, so I know what they'll do. But I think the, some coaches overestimate on knowing that data and information, or information. I'll say information is probably better word than data. I mean, I think that kind of gets into your overall philosophy, and and I would say that you know you definitely want to have all your data. Like yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm definitely, I definitely want to try and know as much as possible. But you know, the teams that we're gonna play. Um, you know what they're going to do. Not, not that you know what they're going to do, but you have an idea of what their philosophy is. You know they're not going to come out and run the A11 next week. You know what I mean? <laughs> they're not going to come out and do something crazy. You have a pretty good idea of what you're going to see. Now, within that structure, sure, there's always different things, um, but it kind of just reinforces you, and it gives you some context because, as you know, um, you've been doing this long enough. You're not the same team that you were at the beginning of the no. year. Uh, you never are. And, and even what you think you are going into fall camp, you always have to find something, you adapt, you make, you make a small, uh, you make a certain amount of changes 
through the course of the year. And by the time you get to the tournament, you may be a totally different team than what you thought you were. I can't, I can remember so many times, especially, you know, my first go around with Ben Davis, you know, we came into the year always thinking we were going to be a spread team. And then by the time we get into the playoffs, man, we were literally running 22 personnel most of the time. I mean, that's just, that's just how it, because we, we had the guys we, that's, that's just who we had on our team. So, um, yeah. I think it gives you some context going from first to second. I mean, the team that we beat in the quarterfinals this year beat the breaks off us in the middle of the year. So sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes that's a bad thing. Um, you know, it's it's tough to beat a good team twice. And, uh, yes, it is. you know, it has its ups and downs for sure. I do think it helps with your with your kids' confidence as well because they know what to expect it's it's you know they've already taken a few punches so nothing's really a surprise to them as far as talent level yeah um so breaking down you know everybody does the basic information stuff uh down distance hash all that stuff uh our backfield column uh if you're an offensive coach let me tell you and you're not paying attention to how your running back lines up i i trust me your defensive coaches are I can promise you that. Uh, backfield, gun near, gun far, pistol. Also, the depth. Uh, are, is he up? Is he back? Is he even, you know, chart that for every play? Uh, we do chart that every week. It, there's not always a correlation. Some t- sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. We obviously try to feed that to our kids and, and uh, you know, let them know. It, the one thing, it, it is hard to, you know, from a linebacker's position sometimes to really see is he up? Is he back uh, from a depth per perception point of view? Uh, but we try to just give that to him and make it as easy on him as possible. Uh, sometimes for those apex players, uh, it can be a little bit easier because they've, they've kind of got a diagonal view into the backfield, depending on where they're lining up. So they, they can see that a little bit easier. Um, and, and, it's, and it's not on here, but uh, depending on the team, sometimes we've also charted the width of uh, the running back or the width of the H back. I mean, we played a team this year where 100% of the time when the H back was sitting in the B gap, not shaded, but in the B gap, it was a, it was a pass play. Yeah. And and that's not something you go in and you chart every single week. It's one of those things you just watch enough film and you and you just kind of pick up on something. Wait a minute, let me take a look here, and and you just kind of sometimes you have a hunch and it pays off. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, but that kind of goes back to, you know, having a process, watching the film over and over and over again, and you will find that stuff. Uh, but it's not going to be, you're not going to chart all of this every single week. So, uh, as I said, no directional calls in the formation, uh, uh formation column, uh, motions. We also use this as a shift column, just because frankly, we don't see a lot of, we don't see a ton of pre-snap shifts. I don't know what other guys see, but in our conference, you know, uh, we, we play one team that will move the H back around quite a bit pre-snap. Yeah. Uh, some changes, strength stuff. But other than that, as far as, you know, the Boise State, multiple Matt Canada, multiple tight end shifts and all that stuff. I mean, we don't see that stuff. So uh, if we ever do, I'm sure we can put together some extra columns and stuff in place to chart it. But, you know, we might, we'll play a team that might shift multiple guys maybe once or twice a game. And that's, and that's about it. Um, the uh, running back shift column. Now that is something, um, you know, on, on Twitter, I wrote, uh, I put together a thread of like five things you can do, five easy things you can do to make life hard on a defense. And that was one of them. Just move the running back to the opposite side pre-snap. Because if you're, if you're, especially if you're an RPO or an option team, I mean, so much of what a defense does is, is keyed in on where that guy lines up. So, you know, you don't have to install 50 new plays. If you just make a habit of flipping that guy back and forth pre-snap just before the snap, you know, seven to 10 times a game that really screws up the analytics and it makes it really hard for those kids to key in on, on what's going to happen. So we just put an X in there, not necessarily, you know, if it's a check at the line and they're, and they're moving guys around afterward, that's, that's something different in my opinion, but if they're literally just flipping the back from one side to the other by design, we want to make a note of that. Well, I don't think a lot of defensive coaches know how to necessarily put that in consistently either. So, because some coaches will want to put it in as the formation that you started in. Some will automatically put it into the formation you shifted in. I think it kind of can confuse, especially those very data analytical people, because something will get messed up there occasionally. Yeah, that's a good point. So on that, what I always do is I always tag the formation that they end up in. Because as I said, we don't, we don't see a ton of shifting. Now, if we ever played a team 
that was shifting 25, 30, 40 percent of the game, I would probably create another column and I would tag the pre-shift formation and then the post-shift and, and try to uh, tag that stuff. Yeah. But it nobody we play really does it enough for us to make it a priority. It's one of those things where, you know, offensive coaches, especially on that opening script, they want to throw 15 different things at you. But then once the second quarter rolls around, they're going to, they're going to go back to what they do. Most guys. Now the really good ones, the really tricky ones, they're going to, they're going to keep some wrinkles uh, ready for you. But that's kind of, I feel like what most defensive coaches, their approach is. That's always been, you know, that's always been my personal theory is that, you want, let's let's see what they do after the first couple drives, and then we'll then we'll adjust. But if they're just gonna, you know, you you have all week to plan those first five to ten plays, and yeah. you're gonna try to throw as much as possible. Let's not overreact. Let's not throw out everything we were teaching all week. Let's just relax, let our guys play, and if they continue to come back to it, okay, then then we might have to have a conversation. But most guys don't do that uh, because they don't want to get too far out of their their players' comfort zone for obvious reasons. So. Um, no, but that's a good, that's a good point. I mean, so the, to, to, just to get back in your question, I, I would not spend too much time on it. If, if they don't, if they, if they do spend time on it, I will definitely spend some extra time in, in, in charting all that stuff. Yeah. Um, fib past, uh, past strength into boundary. So if it's a 11 personnel two by two, and those two receivers are into the boundary, I would consider that fib. I don't consider the tight end of the boundary fib with that particular formation. I don't really take the running back into account in all that uh, sort of thing. Just my personal thing. I mean, if you play a team that uh, we do play one team that will get the running back involved quite a bit uh, in the past game, especially uh, in those situations. So that's where we, would, where we would consider that differently. But for most teams, that's how we would play that. Obviously, you know, fib is its own animal you know you got to see what what teams want to do out of it most most teams that we play will dab a little a little bit um i personally love fib i mean if i was an offensive that was another one of those things on that thread that i put together if i was an offensive coordinator i would i would screw around with that constantly because it just it, it yeah i think it forces defenses to make some decisions that they're not so comfortable with uh you're usually plus one into the boundary in terms of numbers so now you're, you're making the defense uh make a choice one way or the other, and it's usually a much shorter throw uh, to the short side of, you know, yeah. it is a much shorter throw to the short side of the field. So uh, I personally like FIB, but that's what we would uh, call that. So obviously we'd have the offensive play column. I usually will not tag personnel right away, especially if it's, you know, if it gets to the middle of the season, you got six or seven games to break down. Um, and I'm starting fresh on a new team. I'm, I'm not going to mess with the personnel column until I go through a couple of games and I really get a feel for, who their personnel are. I'm not going to sit there with the roster and try to match people up right away because I just want to get into it. I can always come back and tag personnel later, but that's just how I do it. Obviously, you know, whatever works for you is is best. Uh, custom columns. So I got a couple slides of, of these. The first one would be check at line. So obviously any check with me stuff, any audible stuff, yeah. whether it's at the line, whether it's from the sideline coming in, I'm going to put an X in that column. So we'll have a cut up of all those. Um, some teams will do it once a game. Other teams, we, we play a team that's pretty good that they will do it probably 30% of the time. They'll do some sort of check with me. Yeah. So we, we, we want to get an idea of what they're doing. Uh, and then RPO throw. So we want to tag, obviously, anytime he actually throws the RPO. We, um, we do not face really any teams that I would consider a true RPO team where it's a ton of post-snap reads. It's more, you know, your standard pre-snap based on the leverage of the defender. But most teams we play don't even throw that very often. Um, you know, obviously your mileage, your mileage may vary depending on where you're at in the country and, and who you're facing. But the teams we play don't do a ton of it. Um, but we do chart when they do it. We were probably the most RPO heavy team in our league a couple of years ago. We've gotten away from it a little bit. Yeah. Uh, just, just because of, you know, for personnel reasons, a number of reasons, but, um, but yeah, we still see it. It's just not a, it's not as big of, of a thing as probably other pe people in other parts of the country. See. I don't think it's as big in the Midwest yet. I just don't think it is. I think it's a, a vastly a so Southern and Western thing. Cause like, I mean, I know, I know some teams in Ohio that do it well and there's some other that dabble in it, but like true, like there are people in us like college, 
to the college ability that the college does. I, I don't know any in our area that do. Like, it's just, it, I think it's just, one, it's year to year, kind of like you said, personnel driven, but at the same time, I think those coaches, I, I don't think a lot of those coaches have fully gone into it in the Midwest yet. Yeah, I mean, we 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 did it uh, several years back. You know, we we our last state championship was in 2017. I mean, we were heavy RPO stuff. But honestly, we were the most talented team in the state at that point. So I don't know that it would have mattered what we did. To be honest with yeah. you, I mean, we ended up ranked sixth in the nation. So we were, we were gonna we were gonna win some games regardless. <laughs> now, those kids don't come in all the time. So uh-huh. we we don't we don't have we don't have the you know necessarily as as talented of a team. Um, so we've had to do some different things, but probably the early to mid uh, 2010s, we were heavy RPO. You know, I'm, I'm good friends with Rich Hargett. I, I don't know how familiar you are with him. He does a lot of stuff with RPO, his surface to air system. Yeah. So we talk about that a lot. So I, I, you know, we don't run RPOs as much teams around here don't run it, but I, I do know how teams like to, to read it, you know, the college style, like you were saying, I just don't see a ton of that around here. But we're going to chart it. I mean, because we will see it at certain points, especially down near the goal line. You know, you get any kind of, you know, tight end dump pass or uncovered uh, inside the red zone where you throw a post over the top of the boundary free safety, that kind of stuff. Um, we'll, we'll see that occasionally. Um, but other than that, it's normally just, you know, pre-snap leverage reads, basic stuff, throw the, throw the off hitch, that sort of thing. Um, we're going we're gonna to tag the option. So any zone read, we don't face any true like triple option teams we did a while ago um you know kevin wright who who was until recently the head coach at img for a while he was the head coach at warren central uh kind of our big rival here and they ran uh wing t triple option for a long time and ran it really well um and and so a couple other teams kind of kind of piggybacked off that around here but it's kind of become unfashionable for whatever reason um (laughs) You know, frankly, it's one of my favorite offenses to watch. I mean, I know it's not very popular, but I I, I was on the wrong end of a lot of those games where where that where that kind of offense uh, lit us up. So, uh, but we we see a lot of the standard zone read type stuff, zone read gun triple a little bit. Um, so we're going to tag all that. The throw is you know sometimes obviously you get an option with your RPO. So we're going if if they do throw the RPO off the option, we're going to tag that as a throw. Uh, scramble drill. We want to know. We want to know how the quarterback reacts when he's under pressure. It doesn't mean this column does not mean he's going to take off and run. It doesn't mean it's a sack. It doesn't mean any of that. Anytime he's just off his normal point in the backfield, um, it could be he's sprinting out. Now, if he's just sprinting out, we're not obviously we're not. That's not a scramble drill. But if he's sprinting out, then has to pull up and then maybe reverse course. We're going to put an X there uh, just because we want to know. Like, does he like to just scramble to his right? Is there a favorite receiver that he likes yeah. to look for? Um, Extra scouting tip, by the way, I swear this works. If you are look, if you're trying to figure out, uh, if you're not sure who a quarterback's go-to guy is in those kind of situations, go look up his social media page. Go look up his Twitter page or Instagram page. Almost always, his favorite receiver will be in the uh, in, in a bunch of pictures with him. Uh, and I, I promise you, with we have we got we got a lot of information out of that. Uh, it, we, I think we were 100 percent on that uh, the past couple of years. So, hey, hey, you got to do what you do to find the information. Sometimes it's something simple as a social media picture. Yeah, I mean, so it, it, it has worked. You know, when, when they do have uh, another player in there, it's, all, it's pretty much always his, uh, his favorite receiver. So yeah. just uh, – and then player target, we're going to put the player number in there. So, they, hey, they threw it to number 88 here. Um, you know, we want to know, obviously, who's getting the football and, and how often. Um, so some more custom columns – Position target. So are they throwing it to the X, Y, Z, slot, et cetera? Uh, this is helpful when you pair it up with the, with the uh, player target because you get an idea of are they moving them around uh, or, or are they just static and this guy's always the X, this guy's always the Z, that type of thing. Uh, the number target, that's the number receiver in the formation. Uh, I don't get into strong and weak necessarily. Uh, you could if you wanted to. Um, but it's just, hey, is he the number one receiver, number two, number three? So if you get a lot of three-by-one sets, especially with tight end away or empty, anything like that, it can help clear up, um, clarify that position where he where he's lining up at. Um, you know, then we're going to tag the route concept. This goes back to dividing up 
the data as much as possible, you know, uh, charting the past concept independent of the backfield action and protection. So, you know, if it's an RPO where you got trips out wide to the field and those two guys are running hitches, I'm going to tag it hitches, regardless of what's going on with the rest of the play. If it's, you know, if it's, uh, you got a, a kind of, a concept to eat if it's a two by two for example you got a smash over here you got a curl flat over here i'm going to tag it smash curl flat okay. uh, so that, that's it's it's simple but again it's just another way to kind of separate all those all that data so then you get to the end of all this you make your big cut up then you can see all all the smash routes etc cetera, etc cetera. uh route thrown obviously we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna chart the route thrown uh you you can get really good with this because uh, if you have the route thrown, if you have the player he threw it to, if you have the position that player lined up at, and you obviously have all your incomplete, complete yardage data, all that stuff, you get a perfect statistical analysis of what routes that quarterback is good at throwing and what routes he's not good at throwing at. I mean, that, that is, that's gold for your, for your DBs. Like, Hey guys, this guy can't throw more than 10 yards. Yeah. Like, don't, don't worry about the vertical stuff. Now, obviously, that's going to come out on film, but sometimes it gets a little bit more detailed than that. Sometimes, you know, those, those sorts of things aren't always apparent. Or maybe they just, maybe, for example, you know, we, we'll play teams sometimes where they might run a shallow cross concept, you know, with your shallow and your dig up top, but they might never throw the dig. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's, it's that kind of stuff, too, that, um, and then you got to figure out, well, is that because it's always covered or is it literally the quarterbacks being told where to throw? Yeah. Cause that'll happen sometimes too. So, I mean, it's, it, it's so much of it is, is just getting as much of the basic data and then you just got to use your eyes and figure it out okay. based on what you're seeing. Uh, and then the last thing here on this is a uh, defender. We don't use this every week, but sometimes it gets really good. We play a couple of teams that are really good, you know, have a lot of things uh, they're good at throwing the football. So, you know, it's, it's interesting to see, are they targeting a specific guy? Are they targeting a specific area of the field or is he just throwing to the open guy? And sometimes you can get a feel for sometimes if you, if you go through and you can also use this by the way, as a tackle kind of a tackle column, if you wanted yeah. to, to help with uh, charting the run game, but you can get a good idea of, of, are they, are they throwing or running to or away from a specific defender? You can figure that out. Uh, if you, if you chart stuff uh, like that. Now, uh, curiosity, I, I kind of want to go back for a second when you, cause you, and when you said play, uh, now, do when you put in the play, do you put like twenty four power in, or do you just say power, or do you say power right? How's that? How's that work? Yeah. Or do you have separate columns for like, okay, this is power, and then I have a separate column for right and left. How's that kind of work for? Yeah, good question. So, generally, uh, we're gonna keep it as as uniform as possible. So it's either power or power weak. Um, and then, like for example, you get a play where you have multiple polars, like counter. Um, it's gonna be counter weak. GT, whoever the, the, the two polars are. So uh, that way, you know, you're still, you're still getting all your information, but no matter if they're running it right or left, you're still getting the same information regardless. And we do have a right or left column as well that, that we use um, to, for all that stuff uh, as well. We actually flop our tackles and guards. Uh, nobody else in our conference does that. We've been doing it for as long as I've been here uh, and, and a lot longer before that. Um, it just works for us. I uh, have not seen anybody else that we play do that yet. I know Nevada used to do that when, uh, what's his name was there? Uh, Chris Alt. I yeah. know they did that for a while. Well, that, it, I think it's one, I think it's become a lot more common too. It's very, it, we see that a lot in Ohio. Like I, I typically it's like the wing T and the double wing teams will flip their lines. I know some spread teams are kind of dabbling in it. I know some spread OCs that are dabbling with it. It kind of just varies on. I don't know comfort level and bring somebody bring it on staff that can justify it. Usually, usually you, it requires O line coach buy in from my experience um, of some kind. But yeah, I mean that's I mean I've probably spent half my year half my career flipping the line. Um, it's just yeah. what we've always because it, it from a learning perspective it's so simple for your offensive line. You're always doing this on this play. Yep, and and it just it cuts down your verbiage a yeah. ton. You know, you, you don't have you, you don't have a, a weak left and a weak right call and all that stuff. It just and you know your your quick guard is is your polar. So you want you want to run power. You don't have to. You really only have to worry about one guy most of the time. We 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 had been, uh, you know, 
late 80s through the 90s and early 2000s, we had been a heavy I formation team and, you know, power, midline, ISO, all that stuff. Um, but even when we went away from that and went more to gun, we just kept it because it's what we did and it's what we, we had always done. And, you know, hey, it's what you know. It, it, it works, right? I mean, so, yeah, it's what you know. It's one less thing you got to teach guys. And I don't recall ever actually ever having a conversation about switching it. I don't know why we would, but it's, it's interesting. Cause you know, if for whatever reason in my area, at least in the, in the, with the big schools around here, I, I don't know of anybody else who does it, but that, I guess that's just one more thing that the teams have to worry about with us, you know, that's different. Um, so specific personnel columns, again, this is not something that we will do honestly, most of the time, but if I want to, especially as, I'll tell you where this is useful when you want to go in and tag each player at each skill position is those specialized personnel groups like short yardage, like jumbo personnel um, and 22 personnel. Th those types of personnel groups where you have a whole season cut up and you might have 20 snaps of one personnel group and, you know, they might bring up, bring in a D lineman or they might bring in an extra couple tight ends. And those guys, you might find those guys move around depending on what the play call is. Uh, so, you know, those are the type, those are the type of personnel groups where you get into it. And again, I'm going back to this. This is another thing I wrote on Twitter, like ways to make life difficult for a defensive coordinator, yep. those specialized personnel groups, if you can have different formation, wildly different formations out of those specialized personnel groups. So for example, you got a 22 personnel group. Okay. Everybody, they, they're running their big guys out on the field. Well, they're going to line up in the eye and pound the ball, right? Well, if you had some way to line up in some sort of empty set out of that, that will come. I mean, they first of all, defense is going to have to call a timeout because they, they won't know what to do because they spent all week lining up playing cover zero against those big guys, right? You, that's, that's generally something you have maybe one or two calls for in that scenario. Um, so you're kind of taking advantage of, the the lack of the lack of time in that particular segment of the game plan um but that but that's exactly coming back to uh scouting the offensive side you know you get into those specialized personnel groups and you're and most teams really only have three or four plays out of it i mean it's not something yeah. that you're gonna you're gonna you're not gonna have 20 plays on the call sheet for jumbo most teams unless you're, you're a double wing team or something yeah i when we don't play them so i don't have to worry about them but it, a lot of times you will see that guys moving or guys moving around depending on where the play is they're going to move their best tight end to the point of attack no matter whether it's a right or a left call or, or whatever um so uh and and the other thing that you can again we don't do this very often and we definitely don't do it with every opponent uh but you do want to make a habit of drawing up where the best player on the field lines up, you know, or the best two players. You, you have to do that because, you know, we played one team uh, near, uh, you know, I'm not going to say who it was, but we played one team who had very specific rules about where their receivers lined up. I mean, they, they didn't have a ton of formations. Uh, they were kind of a two by two, three by one type of team but they had very specific rules about where each guy was going to line up. So if they were in trips, that best player was always, if he was to the right side, I can't remember which is which, but for example, if it was trips, right, he was always at number two, but if it was trips left, he was always at number three, that was ironclad. That did not change. So that affects the routes that you're going to see from that guy. Yeah. And that affects if they want to get him the ball, that affects what they can do. So feeding your kids that not, not the grand scheme of things, but feeding your kids and letting them eliminate options from the menu when they're lining up across the, from that guy, it, it's a game changer. So is that going to happen every week? No, but that's part of the puzzle that you're solving every week. You're trying to find those things. So that's one way to get it. Uh, and then, you know, finally here, we don't film signals, but Hey, sometimes people send you signals on film. It happens a lot. I don't know yeah. if it happens to you, you know, but what, what ends up happening a lot of times you got that parent or you got that freshman coach who would rather be doing anything else. And he's not, he doesn't really care what he's filming. And he's, you know, when they're checking from the sideline or he's starting the camera way too early, uh, you're, you're getting the signal. So you, first of all, you better have multiple signalers if you're going to signal, like, I don't understand people don't do that, but, <laughs> but you, but you better, <laughs> 
if, if people give you that, if people give us that stuff, we're going to at least take a, we're not going to spend a ton of time on it, but we're going to at least take a look and see if there's some easy wins there that we can, you know, get yeah. a jump on. Um, cause I, trust me, I've been on the other sideline where I knew all the signals because they weren't using multiple signals and it didn't matter. So uh, yeah, you still got you still got to play the game, <laughs> but if we can find one or two easy wins there, we, we will. Um, Part of that also goes back to, and I can't remember if I put this in here or not, but using all the information sources possible, meaning no matter who we play, I'm going on YouTube or I'm going on their streaming site and I'm looking at the TV copy of the game as well to see if there's anything else, whether it's pace of play, whether it's, whether it's signals, whether it's, you know, trying to get a, a feel for when they're substituting or how they substitute or, or anything like that. Um, that is, that is something that's invaluable. You know, I was talking to a coach, uh, another special teams coach, and he brought up that point, you know, getting ready for a particular team who ran a shield punt. We're on, we're on film. The shield punt was already lined up. So they spent all week talking to their kids about, all right, here's how we're going to get lined up to the shield. You know, we feel like we can block one this week. Well, you get into a game and they realized that, well, they just run them onto the field all of a sudden and snap the ball. They don't give you a chance to line up. And he said, we didn't look at the actual TV copies of the games because if we did, we would have known that. Yeah. So that's the type of stuff that tempo, anything outside the normal film, I, you know, are, do, do you spend six hours a day looking at that? No, but you, you want to scan through it and just see if there's anything extra that, that you've seen. This is, that's kind of your, your final step. And also it, it does come in handy. Because at least in our conference, we don't trade every game um, officially anyway. I mean, there, you always have a way to get stuff, right? Uh, but sometimes we can't get a game. So the good thing about playing in a metropolitan area is almost everybody's games, or 90% of them are on TV or online or in some, some form or fashion. I mean, now with COVID, everybody went to pay-per-view. So that's even better for us. So I, I want somebody's game. I just have to pay 10 bucks and I got the copy of the game. So it's it's great for us because we can take a look at everything else everybody else is going yeah. has going on. I agree 100. That's how we got um, saw some things this year with YouTube. A couple of teams had their games on put on YouTube, live streamed on YouTube, and they left it left them up, and we're like, oh okay, watched it. Yeah, we had uh, we've had that is another thing by the way. If you do have a coach that comes into your area from you know brand new, he's not from around there, which we have occasionally. Well, what do you do? You go on YouTube and look up his games from last year and kind of see uh, see, what, see what you're dealing with, basically. Try to get an idea. Like, are we going to have to make wholesale changes here? Do they do anything? So that helps as well. I mean, you go on YouTube, you got, at this point, probably five to ten years worth of high school games from all different parts of the country uh, stored somewhere. So it's a, it's a great, it's a great uh, tool to have available and it usually doesn't cost m much of anything. Well, not, well you, the other thing is with Huddle's limits on data. I mean, you, you have to put it somewhere. I know some programs have just started putting all their games outside like the past three years on YouTube um, and like under their, either their football program or under their athletic department, which is all, um, or some have just started dropping them on in, in like a school district Google Drive. And they put all their games on there now that way they're there if anybody else needs them. Um, I know our, my former ops guy where I coached last year, um, he has all, like, prior to, like, two years ago on external hard drive. So, and he's yeah, got, like, that's something. When, when that whole thing came around, yeah, we absolutely. So, we're going to keep all our film, and we're going to keep every opponent film that we get our hands yeah. on. And we're – so – We'll break it down like normal, and then, you know, whenever that time comes, we're just going to export it as individual clips. We'll export all the data. So if for some reason we need that film a couple of years from now, we've still got it. We know it. We, we have the ability to see all the trick plays or whatever, whatever that might be. Um, so we're never going to let that be the reason why we can't find something. Now, how often is that going to come into account? Probably 2% of the time, maybe, but you never want to be stuck without it. So yeah. it's, it's very easy to do. And like you said, you can do it on, we, we have a Google drive, we put it on. Um, so, I mean, why not? Right. Like it, it, it doesn't take that much time. And it, it's, it can be one of those things you do in the off season. Once, once you're done, wh whenever your season's over, uh, just spend some time, export it. And now you've got a backup just in case. I mean, that's something that we, we do for sure. Um, just some, just a few, 
other general notes here, you know, what's their field goal range? I mean, that, that sounds obvious, but you know, are you really taking that into account when looking at what the, what an opponent offense is going to do? Um, you know, especially like on third down when they're on the edge of field goal range, you know, when they're kind of in that, uh, in between zone where it's not necessarily a gimme, how aggressive are they? Uh, are they gonna try and screen you? Are they going to drop back and, and give them, give uh, you a, target back there in the pocket to potentially knock them out it's, it's those little things I mean this is something that you know once you've got all your basic data done you've got all your basic cutups done then you can kind of dig into to stuff like this uh p and 10 possession and 10 uh you know we, we, right now we chart this as a zero in the down and distance column uh we have used a custom column for that in the past you know whatever you feel like is best for you uh but it, it is important the other thing that I would put along with p and 10 is after any timeout, quarter change, injury, any time where the offense has the ability to bring their guys to the sideline, talk things over, any any uh, extended stoppage of play, uh, because you know depending on who you're playing, you you could end up seeing something. I mean, uh, for for many years, and I can say this now because it's not in our we don't do it anymore. But for many years, you know, uh, whenever we call a timeout in a big situation. I didn't even have to ask our offensive coordinator what play was coming. I, I just knew we would we would boot out and run a, a, a tailback throwback uh, away from the boot to to uh, our best player because that's nobody ever covered that for some reason, um, <laughs> and I didn't even have to ask because I, yeah. I already knew what the play call was because we we called timeout. All right, guys, you, you know what this is, right? Okay, perfect. Let's go do it. It, it worked. It didn't work every time, but it worked most of the time. Yeah. Uh, so you know. Uh, when when you have a, when you have a timeout in those type of situations, just understand that you're probably going to see some movement. You're going to see something that's going to make you have to think and and, and be uh, give you a little deception there. Uh, I don't care about generic down and distance information. I want to I want to cut it up as much as possible. Uh, I think uh, I think you're kind of wasting your time if you look at generic. You know that summary report that Huddle gives you. Huddle does a lot of good things, but. I can't think of one good thing that I've ever got out of that summer report because the, you know, everybody else has that information too at this point. And I don't think anybody, I don't know about you, but I don't know many offensive coordinators who are sitting there, you know, well, you know, I really like to run here because it is second and four. And I usually do that. I mean, pe people don't make decisions that way during yeah. the court. I, I don't believe that they do. Uh, now when you get into personnel groups, that's when you can start to narrow in on things because if they got 10 personnel versus 22 on the personnel on the field that you you really narrowing down the scope so that's when you can get into playing those games a little bit and i mean that i'm not breaking any news here every defensive coordinator knows that but yeah. um i just you know i think sometimes especially younger coaches you you do the the basic breakdowns after putting in the data and you think you've done something you, you got to go a little bit deeper than that is, is what I'm trying to get across to you. Okay. Cause like I said, that summer is that summer report. If you print it out, it looks like you've, it looks like you put together a lot of interesting things, but you know, make sure that you're actually digging a little bit deeper and, and, and putting the right stuff in there together. Um, this is a pass game hit chart. Like I said, this goes back to what I was talking about. Do as much by hand as possible. I think I've tweeted about this a few times. Um, you know, this is very easy to put together. All this is is just a Playmaker Pro field template. Uh, you know, I've got uh, here on the left, you see the offense in the middle of the field. On the other, uh, to the right here, you've got it on the hash. So what I will do is I am going to, the, the, the one on your left, I'm going to chart every single throw, no matter where the offense is at on the field, because I'm charting to the left or the right. So if the offense is on, you know, their right hash, and it's a throw to the right, numbers i'm going to chart to the right numbers now if they're on the right hash and i'm going to chart that same throw over here to the right sheet i'm going to chart that to the left numbers because that's into the boundary so i'm, I'm charting i hope everybody can follow me because i feel like i'm not i'm not making total sense here but <laughs> bas basically um i'm going to chart every single throw on the left right chart on the field boundary chart i'm only charting the throws that are on the hash yeah, I get you. So that so that way, by the end of it, I get a really good idea of is there any place that they're really targeting more than the other? Uh, I will mark an X for an incomplete pass. Uh, I'll usually, if there's, depending on how many games I have to do, I'll, I'll try to 
uh, write down the name of the route that was thrown as well in that particular area. Um, I just stole this idea. You know, I watch. You know, we've all seen the shot the shot hit charts on basketball and ESPN. Yeah. I think they, you know they've done similar things with football. That's that's all this is. I just took it and I wanted to do it by hand and just see. Um, I know a lot of guys do like the big field zones where they kind of cut the field up into nine different spots. That's not, you know, I, I don't think you get enough out of that personally. I, I would much rather be super super specific because what will happen is, you know. We played a team that, you know, that 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 uh, boundary area, you know, 10 yards and, and shorter, I mean, it was filled up with stuff and not much of anything else uh, was marked up. Now, obviously, where are we going to put our best corner? We're going to we're just going to play into the boundary the whole game. And, you know, we it, it definitely helped. Um, the other cool thing that you can do, it, it might not be that obvious, but you know, you might see that, hey, this team doesn't really throw outside the opposite hash that often. I mean, when I'm looking at a quarterback, that's the first thing I want to see is what is the furthest he can consistently throw? Yeah. Can he throw from that one hash all the way to the deep opposite numbers? If he can make that throw, we got to work cut out for us. If he can't or if they just don't throw it for whatever reason, well, then, all right, now we can begin to condense the field a little bit. Now our jobs are a little bit easier. We played a team that hardly ever threw outside the opposite hash. Uh, but when they did, it was usually in the first or second drive. It was the beginning of the game. Yeah. So going back to, you know, sometimes OCs will throw stuff at you at the beginning just to throw you off your game and show you something. And then after that, they hardly ever did it ever again. And so we, we told our kids that, uh, and they were a pretty good team, and, and we actually beat them because we, we basically were playing, we didn't have to defend a full third of the field when they were on the hash because they just never threw the ball that there. Well, to your point, like, I won't go back to your field zone thing real quick. I've never heard a grown coach say, oh, they throw the field zone six a lot. Like, no, no. one ever has that conversation. Like, I told, I, I've always thought the, those field zones were stupid as it is, even when I was a DC. Like, it just, like, and, and then the other thing is your loose interpretation of what, like, when it's, like, in that iffy area, like, what is, what is, what is the difference between zone four and seven or whatever? Like, it's yeah. just... No, just, okay, how far can he throw? Do they throw the boundary? Do they throw the field? Do they like to throw the middle a lot? Like, that's more what I need to know. Yeah, I mean, like I said, you can you can make these very easily regardless of what program you use. I do have them for sale on the website, but, you know, if you want to just buy, but, again, it took me two minutes to put this together. So, you know, yeah. whatever you got, whatever you want to do. Some people have bought them. But I, I honestly, that's the, I never thought I'd tell people not to buy something of mine, but I'm like, guys, you can put this together in like two minutes, but some people just want it ready made. So, um, but yeah, I, and that's, that's the good thing about what you're talking about. I can get super specific. I want to, I want to know exactly where that ball was thrown. And, and by the way, this is a great thing to do for your own offense as a self scout mechanism, because we did this in the middle of the year this season. And boy, did we find out a few things that, you know, we should have been doing differently. Uh, and so definitely do this for yourself on a regular basis. But, you know, we, we don't do this ever. This is another one of those things. We don't do it every week. Uh, but against, you know, maybe the top half of our conference, we're going to do this because we're going to see if we can find something. And we're going to see if we can eliminate certain routes, certain parts of the field. And, and how good is that quarterback? So that's one thing. Uh, this is the other, uh, this is an example. This is actually from the Coastal Carolina breakdown that I did, but this is basically the, the same kind of breakdown format that I will use week to week because what is going to happen is we're going to put all these formations up on the big whiteboard in our coach's office, and we're going to go through every single one of them. So, I mean, you can see here at the top, you got the formation drawn up. I have the, all the motions put in here. Uh, and then I'm just trying to put together a run game hit chart, speed option, QB lead draw, power RPO, okay. power RPO. So one thing, just the way I do it, I, I mentioned when I was putting in the play name, um, you know, it's power, power week. If it's to the weak side, I'm still going to call it power here just to, just, just because that it, it for simplicity's sake. Um, the, the next part of this, I'm going to, I'm going to, kind of put together all the pass game stuff. Now, the one thing is I will count, if you notice here, I'm putting the power RPO in the run game and down here 
with the pass game as well, because obviously it could be either, right? So your total snaps on the sheet are going to add up to more than you actually had. But I just found it, it's just an easier way for our kids yeah. to understand it and, and just to lay the data out. But, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, here's all their, their concepts out of this formation. And then I'm going to put the position target, you know, tailback got it three times, H back got it twice, you know, two passes, that sort of stuff, pretty straightforward. And this is actually a, you know, we don't get this fancy week to week, you know, that would take a lot more time. <laughs> uh, but that's something that occasionally, you know, if we're putting in like end of season reports or something like that, we'll put this together. Um, kind of the same idea. Uh, and um, what did you use to put that sheet together? Just out of curiosity. That's, that's Playmaker Pro. Oh, yeah. I, I, um, I use Playmaker Pro for a long, long time. And I still, I still use it sometimes, but I actually just started using Just Play Sports uh, this week. And the I got to say, I'm pretty impressed. So I, I will probably, I'll probably stick with that. But, you know, whatever, you could make this with PowerPoint. I mean, to be honest with you, it, it wouldn't matter. But uh, I do, by the way, have this template on my side as well, but it doesn't take that long to put together. But if you do want it ready-made, it is there. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, uh, let me see. So last thing, I, ideas for this season. Um, I was telling you before we started, you know, uh, Coach Bartley had a great video. You guys should check out uh, on this channel. Uh, basically on, on this same topic, breaking down, and he talked about what he does. One thing I really, really liked uh, is he charts surfaces, not just formation. So he basically cuts the formation in half and, and charts what they're going to do out of each look. I really like that idea, especially against the wing T team that we play, because I, you know, that's that's something where you might not get the same formation, but they're still running things to that same surface um, to a, to a particular side. So that's going to be helpful. And the other thing, uh, I want to spend more time on situational uh, columns. So you know, there's time situations and there's field position situations, right? Two minute drill, four minute end of half. You know, you have to score or you need one more first down that type of thing. And you can get as creative with these as you want. Um, edge of field goal range, red zone, uh, pre-red zone, green, whatever you want to, whatever you want to put together. But that way you're not, uh, that, that way you can kind of tag it, whatever you want. I, I think sometimes it, it gets kind of tedious if you're just relying on the yard line uh, markers in huddle. Uh, you know, that's just been my experience, but you know, whatever, uh, whatever is easiest to obviously, for each coach is, is what works for them. But that's that's probably something I'm going to spend more time on yeah. Uh, yeah. going into this year. Okay. Oh, yeah, Bart, Bartley did a good job with that. That's kind of something he's kind of been – he's been like the scouting guru in our area forever as what kind of people have known for. And he's kept some of it close to the vest, some he'll talk about. And with the head coaching change, he kind of just went all for it this offseason. So. Well, I can tell you, I, I mean, I'm – if. I can't think of anything that I'm holding back right now because yeah. my view is I want everybody that we play against to know exactly what we're watching all the time Yeah. because I want them to worry about everything because the, every <laughs> minute they're worrying about themselves is one minute they're not getting better at what they're doing. So yeah. uh, that that's just my personal view. Like we're watching everything. Yeah, we, we will. So um, that's, I, I'm, I'm just uh you know, if any of my, if any of our opponents are watching this, we're we're watching everything. Oh, so. I, I will guarantee at least one or two of your opponents watch this. I will. <laughs> I, it's amazing how many people I get to watch some somebody else's stuff and then tell me about it. Um, I'm I'm curious though, like how would you flip this? Like, because I'm an offensive coordinator now, how would you flip this for me scouting the defense? Like, obviously, you, I you, I mean, the common thing would be okay. This is who's making the tack, who's the tackler, um, probably front. It's one high, two high, but how would you – I know you're more of a scouting the offense guy, but how would you flip that perspective? I think it all has to start with personnel. Um, so and, – and when I say personnel, I mean where is each guy lining up? Like if you don't understand how the other team is lining up their best personnel, you, it has to start there. So are they flipping their corners? Are they How are they rotating their defensive linemen? Do their linebackers play the whole drive? that type of thing. I think it has to start there. And then what have other people done against them? What is, what has worked against them? That that's the next part of it that you got to put in there. Um, and then I would, I would honestly t 
tag uh, several of those same columns like hey how many was this guy targeted on on a pass route what kind of pass route was he targeted on what kind of what yeah. kind of concept was he was he were they attacking with him um you know when i was at indiana state and I was breaking down the defense, they still had me break down the opponent offense that they were going against. So they would they would have me put in the formation, the play, all that stuff. So that way, hey, man, these guys really suck against the zone read. You know, let's let's think about that this week. Um, you know, that that's that's where I would start. It, it, it would be, and obviously you get into scheme and all that stuff later on, but I, you know, I think at least for us. You know, we don't see in terms of coverages, at least that different of structures week to week. Um, you know, we'll see some four down, some three down. Um, but as far as the coverage stuff, we honestly play the most unique coverage stuff in the conference that anybody's going to see. We play that Iowa State three safety type of stuff that that nobody. Uh, there's a there's a few other teams in Indiana that run it, but nobody else in our class right now really runs it at least as a base there's a couple of people with some nickel type stuff yeah. um but i think it i think part of that uh, goes back to just being familiar with who you're going against and 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 I, and you know you kind of know right going into each week and we're going to see a four three cover four this week right we're going to see four two five in split field coverages like you kind of know that already so to me the interesting part is how are they flipping their personnel around and and what have they struggled with on a man-to-man basis like that once once i've got all the basic stuff done that's where i would uh that's where i would spend my time on one thing i didn't talk about by the way which is not on this slide but it is on my mind is doing a better job of breaking down protections um that's something that we could have done a better job of last year especially in long yarded situations especially with under center pro style teams who you know you slide that center one way or the other and all of a sudden you could end up with a big gap uh, in protection, but we're, we may not necessarily be sending anybody. Um, so that's another thing that I want to do a better job of is, and I've talked to se several people about um, putting together rules about how to, how to kind of classify and, and break down uh, different pass protections. So that's another thing uh, I forgot to mention as well. So coach, do you have any kind of like closing thoughts on this or, um, I we and I know you just briefly mentioned it, but I think I think most people kind of know that you you broke down Coastal Carolina's offense as well um, to an extraordinary depth. Um, um, I know my buddy purchased the book already. He texted me the other day about it. Um, so, but like I mean, I I said so I'm gonna ask you this question: Why did you start breaking down college offense? Because I know you did the Coastal. Didn't you do one on like Gus Malzahn as well prior? Like why did why have you why did you start doing that at curiosity? Um, well, a couple of reasons. I mean, it's it's something that you know it just goes back to loving football, right? I mean, yeah. you just kind of want to you you want an excuse to dive in and and um, you know I think a couple of people had done some similar stuff, you know, putting out books and things like that before I started doing it, and so I was like, well. Why, why not me? So why don't I try to do, do some stuff like that? Um, but Coastal was a, just a unique thing just because of, you know, like I, I think I said this earlier, you know, I love the option. Uh, I, I've never actually been a part of an offense that really was a true option team, but I love Paul Johnson. I love all that stuff. So anytime you get any kind of op triple option uh, offense, uh, midline, triple, you know, counter option, freeze option. I mean, they do it all, by the way. I mean, yeah. it, it was a really fascinating thing to break down. Um, but uh, it just gives me excuse to watch film and, and, uh, you know, get paid a little bit of money for, for doing it, to, to be honest with you. It, it, it does. It's not more complicated than that. Yeah, no, I, I get you. I get you. Um, have you ever, like, speaking of gun option, have you ever looked at like any of Bob DeBisi stuff, former New Mexico? Yeah, you know, um, I actually, yeah, I was actually, when he, uh, presented a at AFCA. I was actually in the front row a couple of years ago because I yeah. was a big fan of what he did. Uh, I I would I did not watch the Georgia Southern offense really at all this year, uh, but I've had several people tell me that it was very, it was similar in a lot of ways to uh, what Coastal did. I was really familiar with what he did in New Mexico. Yeah. Uh, I did I did break a lot of that down. I never really put it like together a project on it or anything, but I watched a lot of that. Um, so it was. 
and I did it before he presented at AFCA. So I, I kind of already, uh, <laughs> it, it was cool to, to do all that and then kind of go in and, and listen to his, his words on it. It's not his view. Obviously it's his offense, yeah. but just what, what he was actually doing and kind of checking myself and seeing how right I was on certain things. But no, I, I love uh, any kind of gun option stuff. I think uh, you go across the country. That's probably one of the most common offenses you're going to see because it works. Oh, I, it's amazing how many coaches I've had talked to me about. Do you know anybody with Coastal Carolina film? Do you know anybody with Georgia Southern film? Do you know anybody that knows anything about the offenses? Like how many people want to try to run it and because it's kind of the in vogue thing at the moment? I will say this, um, probably by the time this video comes out, I, I am going to have, I'm, I'm working on a, a coach tube course of, of coastal Carolina putting yeah. together kind of building on that because, yeah. um, and, and that's, and going back to, I think we mentioned at the very beginning, it's the coastal Carolina thing is not on Amazon because what happens is I put these things together and I spend all this time researching. And then as soon as I get it done, I'm like, ah, I wish I would have put that in there. I totally forgot about this or man, I just found this. So what I'm doing, I'm actually uh, sending out a couple updates, uh, you know, uh, over the next month or so as I continue to go through and find things because that that's always the worst part of it. It's like, man, I could have written a whole other chapter on this thing right here. And and so I, I just, I wanted to try something a little bit different and, and, and just, uh, so yeah. anybody who orders it is gonna get that stuff automatically. You don't have to pay extra. You buy it now, you'll still get it later on. Um, but I just kind of wanted to just kind of experiment and see how it goes. And, yeah. and uh, so I, I'm working on that update. I'm working on the coach tube course, um, but it, it's been really interesting. And, and, you know, as I'm winding that down, I'm also looking at B, BYU is probably the next uh, scheme yeah. that I'm uh, gonna look at. And he just left there for what? Baylor, right? Baylor, yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, that, that uh, it's, it's, it's very similar. I mean, it is basically a toned down version of Matt Canada's scheme, you know, yeah. uh, wide zone, jet sweep, uh, just without the massive amount of pre-staff shifting. They do a little bit of it, but not nearly, you know, what he was doing a couple of years ago. You, you mean the Pittsburgh Steelers offense that we'll see next year? <laughs> That's going to be interesting. Uh, I, I I have no idea. I, I don't even know at this point, do, the, do they know if the Roethlisberger is coming back? or No, what, but I don't, on? like, I... I, 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 well, I assume he is. He's supposed to make like $42 million or something obscene like that. Like, he, it's like, I know Drew B's just negotiated like a pay cut, which pretty much signaled he's probably retiring just from a cap standpoint. But Ben Roethlisberger, I know, has a massive cap hit for this year. You're not, I'm, I'm sorry. No one's, no one's like leaving like between 35 and $45 million on the table. You will play another year unless you physically can't. Like, it's just, now, yeah. and no, I think I and I'm kind of with you. I, blame them. It, it, it's kind of like I say kind of when I hear like certain people get together and work together. I'm like, ooh, that's either going to work really well or that will be a dumpster fire. There's no like in between. And I, I hope Matt Canada's successful. I know a guy who's a coach would play for Canada at IU. Um, and like I said, I think it would be very – I think it could work very well um, potentially. It would be interesting to see – um, how much of that he actually does or how much he meshes with what he learned in the NFL this year as a quarterback's coach. I think you're kind of limited uh, by in the, I, I think part of a big part of that pit stuff was, you know, they weren't as talented as the teams they were going up against. So they kind of had to do a lot of different things. And then you know, at LSU, I don't, I don't know that you need to do all that stuff. You got some big guys on the line. You can create movement. I think they went up and, and lost at Mississippi State that year. Yeah. And that was kind of the big oof, you know, moment for for a lot of people. But no, I mean, I'm, it's gonna be interesting. I mean, he's he's been around for a while. I, I do remember when he was at IU. He actually uh, uh, came to one of our uh, coaches association meetings and, and did a whole clinic thing. So he's a super cool guy. I, I definitely, uh, uh, you know, hope. You know, hope it all works out for him. But, yeah, it's going to be interesting. I, I, I have no idea. I do know that, that that 2016 pit offense, though, was still super interesting just from an X's and O's standpoint to look at. And and that's what appealed to me about BYU is it's kind of continuing yeah. on that same trend. Okay. Well, Coach, I appreciate you coming on. Um, coaches, uh, check out the bio for, obviously, if for some reason you're not following Coach Kirby. Um, 
His, his Twitter bio, his Twitter link will be on down there. Uh, his link for his new book at, for Coastal Carolina will be down there as well. Click on that. You can get access to that. Um, and um, as always, again, if you want to listen to certain parts back through, there will be uh, video tags at the bottom uh, at the bottom in the bio uh, for y'all to click on if you want to go to back to a specific part. Um, if you're listening to this on Anchor, Spotify, or App Podcast, and you want to see the visual, again, uh, just go to my YouTube channel. Uh, it'll be all on there. Uh, keep an eye out for Coach's Coach Tube section, and I know he's got a couple other projects in the works to keep an eye out for. Um, this was another episode of the Gap Down Backer Podcast. Uh, thank you, Coach. Uh, stay safe and stay healthy. Likewise. Thanks for having me.